Good day, listeners, and welcome to this week's podcast edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. And thank you for listening. Listener questions this week. We didn't get to all of them. I want to concentrate on one that we didn't get to, David, from Mr. Daniel Foster. He said, while painting the windows on the outside of my house recently, I heard you talking about Walter Raleigh and was reminded as well as Washington and other Burgesses had occasion to conduct official business in the Apollo Room of the Raleigh Tavern in Williamsburg. Uh, Then he says in 1769, uh, the governor dissolved the House of Burgesses, uh, but they regrouped at the Raleigh Tavern. Jefferson was at both of the meetings there. Uh, He said, I've been to the Apollo Room many times, as have I, um, having once worked there. Your discussion of Walter Raleigh reminded me of Jefferson's connection to that tavern, um, by the way, Jefferson once danced with Rebecca Burrell at a ball in the Raleigh Tavern. Later, she would turn down his marriage proposal at Carter's Grove. The drawing room where this incident occurred is still called the refusal room. So Jefferson proposes to Rebecca Burrell. She's not going to marry him. It's youth. It, Jefferson's not ready for marriage either. He he bungled it badly. He was awkward. He you know blah blah blah. It's like everybody's. But story. to this day, that it's called the refusal <laughs> room because think of how humiliating. Well, what's, I've never been there. So what's it like? Is it like period or? Yeah. So Colonial Williamsburg has all these recreated buildings from that time. Some of them authentic. Some of them recreated. It's one of the world's great uh, historical villages. Um, our friend Bill Barker, the, their Jefferson. Um, well, who has recently been, uh, I think he joined Monticello. Is that right? Yeah. And so he's um, the, so he's not at Williamsburg anymore, perhaps. Uh, if I'm, I'd hate to be quoted on that, but I, I believe that's Interesting. correct. Interesting. Yeah. Anyway, so the, the tavern is there, and, and you can go there, and they have receptions there and so on. But um, it was there that the sort of the rump, rebellious government of the, of the House of Burgesses met after the governor dissolved them. And it was there, alas, that Mr. Jefferson was um, turned down. Refused. By the Rebecca refusal Burrow. room. Just, she, um, she thought better of it. She married somebody else, and Jefferson went on to find Martha Wales Skelton. I'm glad you brought that one up because that that, I'm sorry we missed that one. We did kind of run it. And, and by the way, thank you all for your letters. Yeah. We love them. We do. Some are critical. Many are very yeah, positive. There, there was one that I didn't get to that was pretty critical. What what happened? Well, you sure you want to go there? Yeah. It might, it might ruin your day. I got to reach for it. Okay. It's from uh, Patrick McKnight in Philadelphia. Go and, for it. Well, he thanks for us very much for the uh, show. It, and this is interesting. He says, I'm a bit surprised that democracy seems to be such a central theme on your show. The founders, including Jefferson, were very skeptical of democracy. There is a reason the word democracy doesn't appear in the Declaration or the Constitution. Um, Here's that line. (laughs) Jefferson and the founders were concerned about liberty, representation, and natural rights. As Franklin supposedly said, democracy is two wolves and a sheep arguing about what's for dinner. (laughs) In a pure democracy, there's no protection for the rights and liberties of uh, numerical minorities. Mr. McKnight is right that the Founding Fathers were looking for a republic, um, not a democracy, that for most of them democracy was a bad idea. They often use the word mobocracy to dismiss it. And Jefferson himself um, can be quoted on occasion as saying that the first secretion of the will of the people is seldom a good one. It's the second secretion that uh, where there's more distillation of integrity and character that produces good government and so on. I don't think any of them were for a democracy in America. But Jefferson did believe in the idea of democracy, David, and that is that the people are sovereign, and that means that everyone is equal under the eyes of the creator, and that the people have a right to govern themselves in any way they choose. And democracy, although it's probably not a practicable idea, um, is actually the way to distill the will of the people most completely. And Jefferson was kind of enamored of this concept. He just wanted to make sure that our republic was in some harmony it's with that It's an interesting concept. point. Um, he takes you to task. He says, um, he listens to the show mainly for history and not for your well-intentioned but often oversimplified political pontifications. Well, what would, I haven't had trouble reading that. Thank you very much, sir. So yeah. I'm glad that he thinks that he's more sophisticated than the, than the scholar behind the show. Well, yeah, no, 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 don't get to... 
too touchy about it. No, I just think oh, don't don't tell me about oversimplification. Um, let's have an argument about about uh, about ideas. About he enjoys substance. your he enjoyed your recent criticism of the American Empire. But I find it hard to believe Mr. Jefferson would find anything to admire in ideas like a universal basic income and other progressive talking points Mr. Jenkinson seems to advocate. I do believe in a universal basic income, and I think you can find Jefferson essentially advocating exactly that in his letter to Madison in which he said that the world was not created for people to suffer in. The world was created for people to have a farm in. And if the economy cannot produce the farm for every person who would like one, the economy must produce the moral and economic equivalency of the farm. Otherwise, it's a corrupt economy. So if he will go to that letter that Jefferson wrote to Madison during his time in France where Jefferson is saying, how could God put people on earth and not – allow it if they're hardworking and willing to have a living wage. And I think there's no question that Jefferson understood that that's a basic, not right, but it's a, it's a ba- basic fairness question in distributive justice. We need to wrap this up and get to the show, but I must finish this so you can hear it in its totality. It wouldn't be fair. Furthermore, while I agree Mr. Jefferson would share the suspicion of the Trump administration and criticize its incredible lack of civility, I suspect he would be equally alarmed by the increasing support for socialism in America. For some reason, the show seems to spend an inordinate amount of time speculating about Mr. Trump, but no time at all considering the ill-conceived support for socialism among a growing number of citizens. And then he ends by saying, thank you for all you do, and I look forward to sharing the show with others. Very respectfully, Patrick McKnight. Of course, that's just the kind Look, of letter. I think it's important want. that he that he speaks his mind in this way. And so the question is this: Are are we just? Am I just? I'll just take it upon myself, not including you. Am I just um, spewing forth my own view of the world and making a Jefferson, or am I trying to figure out where Jefferson fits in all of this? So Jefferson is a libertarian. He wants you to be self actualized. He wants me to be self reliant. He wants families to take care of themselves. At worst, he wants the parish to take care of the the crippled or the or, or mentally infirm people or, or or poor widows and so on. Jefferson could never have contemplated the welfare state. He's, he doesn't like medicine, although he didn't know our medicine. But he certainly is not uh, for the welfare state as it's conceived of someone say by someone like Bernie Sanders. Of course not. So then, okay, where is Jefferson? Well, Jefferson certainly isn't going to like the world that we have with the 1% controlling more than 90% of the wealth of the country with a shrinking middle class and with a, an underclass that grows increasingly um, restive and angry. Uh, Jefferson spent a lot of time looking at that very set of questions when he looked at the failed state of, of, of pre-revolutionary France. So the, the work of a humanist in this is to try to figure out what Jefferson actually thought in his own time and place and in what context, that's number one, and that's the most important thing. And secondly, what are the implications of that through the course of American history? If, if this program were only about history period per se, locked into the world before the 5th of July, 1826, and it could never look forward, we wouldn't still be doing the program and it wouldn't have much value. If the program merely takes my politics or your politics or, for that matter, this man's politics and tries to say, oh, well, that's what they would want. That's what the founders had in mind. Then that's a complete and unconscionable distortion of the integrity of the humanities. So I'm sure there are times when my own views get in the way of my thinking. How could they not? But but what I try to do, and I hope our listeners understand or accept this, is I try to say, well, what are the implications of Jeffersonian philosophy and vision for a world that he didn't live to see? Does it peter out in 1826? If he came back today, would he be the same sexist, racist, libertarian that he once was? Would he would he make any concessions to centralized government? Would he make any concessions to Hamilton's economic views? We don't know, but we have to try. We have to try, just as every jurist goes to the founding fathers when they try to sort out the Second Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the Ninth Amendment, 
uh, the emoluments clause or whatever else it is, we have to go to the world that we that, that created the foundations of America and try very thoughtfully, generously in context and cautiously to apply that doctrine to a world that includes lasers and cruise missiles and rockets to Mars and try to figure out what of the legacy of the founding fathers, in this case Jefferson, can possibly mean for us, if anything. And I try to be ecumenically um, contemptuous of the failures of, of our modern political system to adhere to the idea of a republic. But I don't honestly know the answer to many of these questions. But I will say flat out, I think Donald Trump violates almost everything that Thomas Jefferson was and stood for in this world and that Donald Trump is in some respects the most dangerous president in our history. And there is no way uh, that I'm going to um, pull that back. I believe there is a clear and present danger um, in the current political situation. Not that other presidents haven't done awful things, including Barack Obama, but I think that we are in really a no man's land here. And I feel like every person who feels strongly about this, historically grounded as I hope I am, has right and even a duty to speak up. I'm not saying impeach this person. I'm not saying um, force him to resign. I'm not saying anything. I'm saying that this is not my idea of what a civil republic is like, and I can't do Thomas Jefferson for 40 years and not have that percolate into this conversation. And so maybe this man will just have to say, I'm full of it. I don't think so. You know, let's, let's, let's back off here just a bit. He's disagreeing with, with, with you. It's a very respectful letter, and he ends by saying he looks forward to sharing the show with others. It would be interesting to further this conversation. I would like to continue guy. the conversation, you know, indeed. There's one, one thing in here that I, I, you know, in a pure democracy, there is no protection for the rights and liberties of numerical minorities. Well, excuse me, that's what America's supposed to do. You know, we rely on the good judgments of those we disagree with to be fair. And somewhere in the last 10 years, that has gone away. And particularly, to back up what you were just saying, in the past two years, there's no room for a discussion about right or wrong. There's just no room for it anymore. And that disturbs me more than anything. That we don't have to be adversaries just to, because we disagree. The mood that we're in as a nation is 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 disruptive and unsettled and dangerous. And so to take a, 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 a puny little example, you know, not even the Kentucky Derby can occur now without a roiling controversy. It's just where we are, where it's just like everyone just kind of falls out, takes sides at each other's throat. Everyone's angry. Nobody's happy. This is just sort of where we are right now as a people. And I want us to cheer up, calm down, argue rationally, be civil, uh, ground our, our arguments and evidence, use historical precedent. So, so that's one thing. The second thing is I'm with it. I'm with him 100 percent. You know, if you take uh, Brown v. Board of Education, a pure Jeffersonian, and Jefferson himself would have said, no, you cannot impose enlightenment. National courts should not step in and impose integration because that's a form of judicial tyranny, and it's also a form of national government tyranny over states' rights and local control. That's what Jefferson would say. He's right. In a pure democracy, it's not clear when integration would have occurred in the American South. This required the national government to step in and say, we are going to protect minorities as against the tyranny of the majority. The same thing happened when uh, President Truman integrated the armed forces. He had the capacity to do so. He could not have integrated the National Guard of, of Texas or Mississippi, but he was able, thanks to his constitutional authority, to integrate the armed forces of the United States. These things frequently come from the better judgment of outsiders who are not in the cauldron of daily existence wherever the flashpoints happen to be. And we need an entity, in this case the national government, sometimes it's the judicial branch, we need entities that can step between the people and their sometimes misguided feelings 
And that's one of the strengths of our system, that sometimes the states serve as a countercheck against federal intrusiveness. Other times the national government steps in and rights wrongs, as in Brown v. Board of Education in Topeka, Kansas. This is essential. This is exactly why our system works. And the people of Kansas, of Topeka, were appalled. Most Southerners were appalled by Brown v. Board of Education. But you know what? It changed the world. It ameliorated the condition of mankind. And sometimes it requires a non-democratic uh, intervention uh, in human affairs to produce enlightenment. And so I, I couldn't agree with him more. You know, we're not a democracy, but we've moved towards a much more democratic sense of inclusiveness. And our republic only works if it makes some bona fide effort to fulfill the will of the people as, as they make that will known uh, to their representatives. Very good, sir. Mr. McKnight, we hope to hear from you again, maybe speak with you. I'm going to say this, and you don't have to react to it. I might. We've been here before as a nation, and even crazier. Um, I did a little bit of checking on Andrew Jackson uh, before. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, he was, observers likened him to a volcano and only the most intrepid or uh, recklessly curious cared to see it erupt. That was biographer H.W. Brands writing about him. But on the last day of his presidency, Jackson admitted that he had but two regrets. Two regrets. That he, quote, had been unable to shoot Henry Clay or to hang John C. Calhoun. Wow. And just so it wasn't a bit of bravado on his last day, on his deathbed, he was once again quoted as regretting that he had not hanged Calhoun for treason. Uh, quote, my country would have sustained me in the act, and his fate would have been a warning to traitors in all time to come. So when he says my, I, I hadn't heard this till today, when he says my country would have sustained me, that sounds like the Fifth Avenue claim of the current occupant, that sometimes it just takes a big, whopping, powerful central figure to go in and do stuff. His two regrets, you've heard me say this before, Eisenhower said I made two mistakes and they're both on the Supreme Court. So it got a little more civil after um, after Mr. Jackson retired. This is going to go down as the longest Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast. No, it's not, but it's a long one. But thank you. We want to continue our correspondence with this bloke. Um, and with the guy from Ireland, too. And, and I, wa I want him to send in a tape expressing... Greetings, Mr. President, in Gaelic, because I wasn't going to butcher that. And f and for our dear friends around the country who have provided uh, lovely <laughs> gifts. And who are maybe still listening. And including Bo. Thanks for the shirt. Thanks for the ham, ham providers. Thanks for the ukulele, my friend Kevin of Thompson, North Dakota. Keep them cards and gifts coming. You said good morning at the top of this. I believe it's dark. It's now midnight. Now. Yeah. All right. See you. Thanks much. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with or about President Thomas Jefferson. Seated across from me is the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. Good to see you, sir. Uh, good morning, my friend, Mr. David Swenson, the semi-permanent guest host of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. And wearing that title as a badge of honor. I don't know that it's morning everywhere in America, but it's always morning for us. <laughs> you know... We, uh, we've we been trying to be a little more diligent this year about answering listener... We love um, our listener mail. Send more. There's Well, there's a lot, but we love getting it, and I, I, I promise you I read every piece that comes in. There was one that came in that uh, I handed to you that really caught my eye because, well, it was from Ireland. Yes, it's a great letter from a Mr. Danny McCarthy, and he provides a an Irish greeting, which I will not butcher by trying to pronounce... Uh, Jefferson was interested in Gaelic. Uh, he actually spent some time to try to get a Gaelic dictionary and grammar. He was going to read Oshin and et cetera, et cetera, typical of Jefferson. But at any rate, this is from a man named Danny McCarthy. He says, today's Easter Sunday, a significant day in Irish history. The Easter Rising was launched by the Irish Republicans to end British rule. On this day, our republic was proclaimed. My question is, what would President Jefferson think of the proclamation of the Irish Republic as a text and the wider rebellion. Well, Jefferson's for a little rebellion now and then, and I think he would look upon the Irish as uh, the oppressed. You know, if you read uh, Tudor and, and Elizabethan and Jacobean history, you see that the British began their 
their long colonial era in Ireland. Um, they attempted to subjugate what they called the savages of, of Ireland, um, and this created the protocols with which they later subjugated the people of the Indian subcontinent and subjugated many of the peoples of Africa, including Rhodesia and South Africa, and subjugated North America, including Canada, which continues to be part of the British Commonwealth, and the United States, which was uh, born out of its rebellion against the British. Uh, Jefferson's for self-determination and home rule. I can't imagine that he could ever believe that the British had a right to colonize or supervise or control any affairs in Ireland. And the, the British meddling that created Ulster in Northern Ireland as a Protestant enclave as against the Republic of Ireland, which is uh, Catholic, I think Jefferson would have been entirely on the side of the, of the indigenous rebels. Um, Jefferson does not talk about this uh, in the course of his uh, 83 years. But I think it's fair to say that Jefferson would be in favor of every liberation movement worldwide that was based on the principles of the Declaration of Independence and, and was seeking the sovereignty of the people. He says uh, something to note. It is because the Jefferson and Jefferson Hour that I now own a copy of the Irish Constitution. You may have seen that any change to our Constitution must go to the people by way of a referendum. We have these regularly. At times, they are divisive. For example, when we voted strongly for same-sex marriage and the women's right to choose, I take that to be choose abortion, the people ultimately accept the outcomes as our choice and then is respected in law. However, we don't always vote as expected. In the case of EU's Lisbon Treaty, the Irish people had the deciding vote whether this would become EU law. We voted no uh, the first time and yes when asked again. Out of curiosity, is this kind of constitutional refresh in response to the sentiment of the current generation – something that Jefferson would agree with. Yes, as you know, if you listen to this program, Jefferson advocated in a famous letter to Madison that we tear up the Constitution of the United States once per generation. That's when he created the phrase, the earth belongs to the living, not the dead. He would be in favor of, of periodic constitutional revision. And one of his principal criticisms of America would be that we have, we have clung to the Constitution of 1787 for an unnecessarily long uh, period of time and that is actually getting in the way of our capacity to stay with the currents of the world. He's from Kildare, by the way, to which I've never been. Never? I need to go to Kildare. Uh, do you have any Irish in you? No. None? No. Every British. I'm, I'm, Everybody's got a little Irish. I got nothing. Oh, no, okay. nothing. But I have read James Joyce's Ulysses, one of the world's great books. I want to go to Dublin just You have to take to a course that. just to read that. It's one you? of the, it's a difficult book, yeah, yes. Yeah. John Mathroll. He writes, why did Jefferson decide to give two gills of liquor to the military every day? He didn't decide. This was military protocol. So when Lewis and Clark uh, went up the Missouri River, every day each man got a, a small ration of, of grain alcohol. Um, this was something that had existed for a very long time. Sailors, let's see, get rum. People in, in, in the military get their gill. Uh, I looked this up, and it's a unit of measurement for volume equal to a quarter of a pint. Yes, I was just in South Dakota at Yankton. You'd love this, and they have a new exhibit there on Lewis and Clark. Really? And I had a role in it because, you know, that map that we published of the Arikara map of the, the, the American West, and they were redoing their Lewis and Clark exhibit, and they wanted to incorporate that map and asked if I could help, and I was glad to. I didn't do much. But then I went down to help dedicate this new museum a couple of weeks ago, and I had a – I was Jefferson. <laughs> it was great. I drove down. They were great. I loved driving the Great Plains. And when I got there, they said, oh, you know, there's an honor guard that's going to lead you to the podium. And there were three guys dressed in Lewis and Clark costumes. And they had the full regalia. And they were – I said, which one of you is Lewis? And uh, I, this guy said, I am. And the other guy said, no, no, I am. You're Clark. And then they got into a dispute over that for a while. But anyway – uh, one of them had a little tin, a little b brass cup um, on a string around his neck. And I said, what's that? And he said, that's a Jill. He had this tiny little brass mug and it was the volume of a Jill. And so that what he, I said, well, I'd never seen that before. He said, yeah, you'd go up to the keg at the end of the day and then the, whoever was the purveyor would, would – you'd, you'd put your 
little cup under the spout and get your jill and drink it. And that's how they knew how to measure out the the ration that each one was entitled to. Huh. I, I, I did I looked up. Jill. Find, I've always said gill. Me Turns too. And I looked jill. it up and it, it said, so somebody will correct us if we're wrong, I'm sure. Thomas Jefferson, as governor of Virginia during the revolution, attended to these needs for alcohol for his soldiers through legislation by the General Assembly. In August 1780, he wrote that, quote, we have lately appointed a commercial agent within whose particular line of duty it will be to provide spirit for the army. So he did. He played this role as governor, but I'm not, what I'm saying is that he didn't invent this idea. This has been around for a very long time. When Lewis and Clark went up the river, they couldn't possibly take enough alcohol to get all the way out and all the way back. And so it ran out at the Great Falls on July 4th, if you can imagine it, David, of 1805. They're at the Great Falls, the biggest wonder and impediment on the Missouri River. It's the 4th of July in 1805, so the country's been around for, what, 29 years. And they has, passed out the last ration of whiskey, and, and, and Lewis says the men got a little drunk because they you know, were working so hard and, and going without he said that it, it, made, it made them tipsy. Something else I ran into, you know, we had that wonderful program with uh, Stephen Freed just recently about Dr. Rush. Benjamin Rush. Uh, and and you know, I, I have an, a number of letters here complimenting him on what a great show. that. Uh, he was, he's terrific. Right, yeah. One from uh, Scott Blake and also one from uh, Brian Kosicki. And, of course, Rush was the medical advisor to Lewis and Clark. And so I ran across some advice that Benjamin Rush gave to Lewis. Okay, what was it? In in searching out uh, alcohol requirements. Um, well, he had a list of 11 things that he thought Lewis should do to stay healthy. Did you know about it's this? It's like there was bathing and... Well, it seemed routine, uh, some, a lot of it. Rest in a horizontal position. I always and, do that. Uh, uh, others, to do, others had to do with fasting, sweating, washing, and... Gently opening the bowels, unquote. Um, yeah, those were the thunderclappers, and they right. didn't gently open the bowels. They blasted open the but, bowels. Well, that's a picture we don't need to see. Yeah. But rules number six and eight must have caused Lewis to suppress a smile. Rule six, the less spirit you use, the better. Yes, be ver that was Jefferson's view. Drink very, very moderately. And rule eight, after having your feet much chilled... It will be useful to wash them with a little spirit. So if he had cold feet, he came in, wash them with a little alcohol? Well, maybe rubbing alcohol, but I can't imagine the men of the expedition wasting alcohol on their feet. Well, that's why maybe why he made him But made I believe, him David, I believe that Lewis and Clark had a secret stash. <laughs> I do. I believe that as captains, well, they had their they own would. stash. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's We've not all, never mentioned in the journals. Well, we all see it in the movies, though, so it must be true. Right. Um, well, Fred McMurray as Meriwether Lewis and Charlton Heston as, as William Clark in the famous movie, The Far Horizon. Mm -hmm. with, you know who, and you know who was Sacagawea? Sacagawea? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Donna Reed. Oh, that's right. Yeah, and, but they call her Sacagawea there. Uh -huh. It's before we realized that her name was really Oh, should we talk about that? Sacagawea. Yeah, it's pretty... Sacagawea. Yeah. Hidatsa. Yeah. Not, not Shoshone. Bird woman. Lewis said... Sakaka is bird, Wea is woman. Sakaka Lewis said Wea. her name is Sakagawea, or bird woman. So he was quoting a Hidatsa source. And he was such a good speller that we can trust him. He was. I'm Clark getting... wasn't. Now you're being mean because am, Lewis is reliable. And you know what? Bad spellers are good for things like this because they spell phonetically. Yeah, I, I, I guess that's a point. There's a really nice letter from a guy named Ben Wheeler. Um, he wrote, uh, actually he wrote to Mr. Jefferson talking about um, reading being such an important part of young Jefferson's life. Oh, I love letter. this letter. Right, and... Um, said that his wife and he are raising two daughters, and they kind of want to come up with this situation where they have a Peter Jefferson library of only 40 volumes. You read this letter and said, that's a great one. So Jefferson's I father— do more than just answer the question. Peter Jefferson was a self-educated man. He didn't ever have any formal training. He had a library of 40 volumes. He, he uh, left them to his son, Thomas. He wanted his son to be classically educated, and Thomas Jefferson said those 40 books made a difference— in his life because he grew up in a house where there were books and book culture 
Well, I want to do a show about this, but I'm also going to go away, thanks to Mr. Wheeler, and make a list of 40 books that every Jeffersonian should have. Well, his children is is what he's looking well, for. Well, no, they're going, have will, to, they're going to have to grow up. Well, read the letter. It's a, it's a great letter, but... Um, We're not going to m- do Mr. Good Wheeler, Night Moon or something here. Well, just, just read the letter before will, you yes. pronounce judgment. Yeah. I just wanted Mr. Wheeler to know that we got his letter, and you were so taken by it, you said... No, let's let's do. We're a doing show a full show that. on it, and and of course you want children's books like Robinson Crusoe and Gulliver's well, Travels. Well, I think it would be really interesting to know what Mr. Jefferson thought kids should read. But right now, sir, adult literature we, is what he thought. <laughs> we need to take a short break. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with or about President Thomas Jefferson. This week on the Jefferson Hour, we are answering listener questions, listener mail, and you have one, sir. I walked in and you hand me an envelope. Here's this letter. Oh, the, the actual piece of mail. Yeah, came. real right. mail. We yeah. love real mail in addition to e-mail. This is from a man named Tim Clemens of Auburn, Alabama, a place I've never been. He said, my name is Tim Clemens and I reside in Auburn. I'm a loyal Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast listener. Your and David's work with the show is greatly appreciated. I truly look forward each week to the civility, open-mindedness, and thoughtful discourse about the third president and the interconnectedness between Jefferson and our current domestic political reality. But now this, David. To further prove those sentiments, I will disclose that I am a Trump supporter and know through your words the daily chagrin he causes you. And yet... Your and David's ability to discuss it so thoughtfully and open-mindedly keeps me craving more. I have many criticisms of our current president, but remain, for the moment, very supportive of him. I will not elaborate further at this time, as the purpose of this letter is related to a different matter. And then he invites me to come do a performance of Jefferson Hour on the Road at Auburn, Alabama, the home of Auburn University. But isn't that nice that even though he can sense that you're some kind of a vile liberal— <laughs> he he appreciates our open-mindedness and thoughtfulness. I'm going from Adamsite to vile liberal. <laughs> <laughs> but that was nice, don't you think? I don't think I'm a vile no, liberal. No, I'm just just joking. I you know, you know me. I you know me politically. You're all over the map. I really am. Yeah, you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And how's your garden? <laughs> <laughs> nice segue. Yeah, Actually, but thank you for that good, letter. Sir. Pretty good, yeah, Mr. Clemens. A very nice man. And if I, you know, if I go to Auburn, at some point you're going to have to come with me on a talk. Really? You've never done it. You know, you won't even go to like Mandan. Right. Yeah. Mm. Go ahead. Okay. Moving on from that, um, we had uh, just a short question from Rob Barron. Do you recall? A veteran. Of course. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, he was listening to the mustard seed episode and. Uh, Uh, When the book and the film The Martian was mentioned at the start of the show, uh, this made me wonder, would Mr. Jefferson have been a science fiction fan? And if so, what would he have read? What were his favorite diversionary leisure reads otherwise? Right. So Jefferson was a voracious reader. Uh, He had a library of about 7,000 volumes, almost entirely nonfiction. He was basically a lover of reference works and nonfiction. He did read imaginative literature. He read his Alexander Pope. He read Chaucer and Shakespeare. And he read uh, John Milton and so on. He, he probably would not be a fan of science fiction, but he would certainly be a fan of science-based literature of any sort. There was science fiction in this time. The most famous example is Gulliver's Travels, which is, I mean, it doesn't really qualify today as science fiction, but it actually is. It's about... Um, these four voyages by a man named Lemuel Gulliver to worlds that are much larger than ours, much smaller than ours. One is ruled by rational horses. Another is ruled by sort of uh, uh, inspired savants, but who also are highly impracticable. Uh, That's um, book three of Gulliver's Travels. It's one of the greatest books ever written. I read it every year. I urge everyone to read Gulliver's Travels. So, yes, I I think that he's not going to be like an Isaac Asimov guy um, no, don't, don't you think he would enjoy the Martian, you know, the, the self-reliance? Once he could get past the technology and accept that. Yes. Because you know, you know, it, it, it is Robinson Crusoe. Exactly. No, you're, you're exactly right. So the Martian is Robinson Crusoe in Mars. This guy is a 
winds up having to survive for a couple of years and grows his own potatoes. Through and science. It's, it's, it's beautiful. I love that. And you know, the Tom Hanks movie, Castaway, is another great modern version of Robinson Crusoe. He goes down on a plane somewhere in the Pacific. Fortunately, there are some things he recovers. He builds a life out of this. Well, weren't we going to do Robinson Crusoe as a book club selection, or did yes. that get shuffled out? Well, I hope not, because it is it is an amazing book. And as you know, our friend Russ, Russ of North Carolina. Eagle. Russ Eagle, the P-Man. He, yep. I gave him as a gift AP right. a couple of years ago right. and said, do the Robinson Crusoe. Well, he had a setback. There was a, there were floods and there were locusts, uh, there were plagues. Uh, you know, everything that could go wrong went wrong. I wrote him recently. I said, "How many peas have you planted?" It's a number of them this year. And I said, "How how many peas have you kept back in reserve in case this year's pea crop should fail?" And you know what he said? One. He has one reserve pea. Wow. If if he if he loses his crop in the year 2019, the world ends. No, he's got one pea. But that is that's that's Robinson Crusoe on steroids. That means that the whole future of his diet. Yeah, it, it occurs to me that we're getting a lot of new listeners all the time. And not now. We, we, <laughs> not <after this. laughs> no, we can't accept the fact that everybody understands the significance in of Robinson Jeff- Crusoe. No, and Jefferson and peas. So come back to well, that. Well, Jefferson loves peas, of course. It's his favorite garden vegetable. And, and, the, and the contest. He had an annual contest with his neighbors to see who could produce the first peas for the table. And the lucky winner had to throw a feast for everybody else. Nelson. Pat Bradowski always provides us wonderful detail about this, and she grows peas of a number of sorts. I think Jefferson had 29 different varieties of pea and so on. He was largely a vegetarian. Well, in Robinson Crusoe, the one little bag of seeds that, that Crusoe accidentally finds from the wreckage of the boat turns out to be um, grain, and he grows and eventually has abundance and produces bread and so on. And so I then, at, a couple of years ago, gave Russ a pea, and said, make this pea proliferate in the Robinson Crusoe way. And he has, but he's shown that there can be setbacks. And now everything depends upon this year's crop or he's down to one pea again. Now, that Robinson Crusoe had a better run. And within a few years, he had granaries filled with grain because of the abundance, the fertility, which is the, the parable of the mustard seed. The idea of this is that human wealth comes from agriculture, that if you put... You can, there's only so much lead in the earth, and you take it out, and that's the, that's the end of it. But if you have a wheat um, seed or corn seed or a, a barley seed and put it in the ground, it can spring up in wonderful fecundity and produce wealth. This is what's known as the, of the economic school of physiocracy, and Jefferson was a subscriber to the notion that all true wealth comes from the soil. I'm going to give you an opportunity to talk about something that you really like talking about. Yes, sir. Uh, Jefferson's tours to France. Jefferson went to France in 1784. He came back in 1789. They were extraordinary years. It's, I've been thinking a lot about this because I'm leading a Jefferson tour to France in the fall in October. I can't wait. I've done it a couple of times previously. I'm, I'm actively preparing now and reading every biography I can get my hands on about this period and all of his letters from France and his trip on the Canal de Languedoc and his he got um, busts made by Udon of Lafayette and of John Paul Jones and so on. He sent Udon to the United States to take the measure of George Washington for the famous statue that now is in the um, rotunda of the Capitol at Virginia, and so on and so forth. This was one of the richest, most extraordinary uh, interludes of Jefferson's life. He fell in love for the last time with Maria Cosway. Uh, he wrote a famous letter uh, upon her departure, My Head and My Heart. At any rate, um, Jefferson in France. And so I'm leading this tour in October, and Jefferson uh, probably would not have been the same person had he not spent time in France, because while he was there... There was kind of a telescoping effect in both directions, David. He became more radicalized by seeing what happens when a, a great nation falls apart. Meanwhile, back in the U.S., the founding fathers became more conservative. And so he was moving, to use our terms, to the left and become a confirmed radical Democrat in some ways. Most of the other founding fathers were drifting back towards the center or to the right 
And so when Jefferson came back in November of 1789, he felt like a foreigner in his own land because he was more radical than almost everybody he knew. He retained his enlightenment values in Europe, is the way I would put it, rather than left or progressive. He and, got deepened in those enlightenment and values. the I shock think. of winning the revolution for those left in America was like, okay, we can't blow it. We better slow down and be careful. But also, he realized, oh, that's a revolution. Ours was a rebellion and fairly harmless by comparison with the cataclysm of the French Revolution. We had a, a great discussion about uh, Jefferson and France just, just a few weeks ago. Come on this trip, people. Come on this journey to France. But the reason I'm bringing it up, because yes, the theme of our show today is answering mail, is we got an email from Kenneth Rubin. Kenneth Rubin. Uh, he's, he said, while doing some reading in preparation for the Jefferson Hour trip to France, so he must be going. I stumbled upon Jefferson's hints to Americans traveling in Europe. You must oh, be yes. familiar with this. Yes, he wrote, he was asked for his thoughts about young people traveling in Europe. And June he wrote out 1788 of, for young Mr. Shippen and Rutledge. So he's in, in France. These Americans are coming over. He's, Jefferson's the great expert. And of course, he's the great expert at almost everything. And so they ask him, what are, how, should, what, how should we travel? And Jefferson writes out, as usual, a detailed list of, of do's and don'ts. It may be as usual, but um, I should say that Kenneth Rubin asked that um, I interview President Jefferson about this, and that might be a real interesting We should show. do that program, yes. But then I took the time to look up Jefferson's hints to Americans traveling in Europe. 19th of June, 1788. His first line is, Old Louis or Dutch Ducats are the best money to take with you. So what's your currency? And then it's like a list of uh, uh, Amsterdam to Utrecht. Is right. That, These is, are low countries. Um, yes. Go on the track scout on account of the remarkable pleasantness of the canal. <laughs> he loved his canals. He, he thought we should be building them, and of course we did. We built the Erie Canal, opened in 1825. You can have the principal cabin to yourselves for 52 st- Stivers? Yes, Stevers. Stevers. At Amsterdam, I lodged at the Wapping Van Amsterdam. Uh, I like the valet to place. He's getting them down into the weeds. Yeah, here, you, you know? know, and it's like, I mean, it's kind of an interesting, um, you but know, he, it, it goes through, it, there's where you should eat, this is where you should stay. Always buy the Van Ordinaire, buy house wine. Uh-huh. He says, climb up, go to the largest uh, cathedral or church in the city and climb to the top. Not because you love churches, but because it's the best view. He said, buy, when you get to a town, buy a map. Go to, he says, gulp down all of the museums and galleries and uh, must-see tourist spots in a single day. Yeah, yeah and it, it, I mean, it's, it's almost contemporary, like uh, Bond, the Court of England. The palace here is to be seen. <laughs> that could be from your daughter to you. you Indeed. Know, it, it's very... Uh, but he says, that, he says at one point, don't spend a lot of time at the court with the, you know, the kings and the aristocrats and the diplomats. And he says, it's like going to a menagerie. He said, it's worth, it's worth looking at, but don't, let, don't get caught up in that. What you're looking for is culture. Here, call for the Moselle wine, and particularly that of Brownberg and of the Grand Chamblain's crop of 1783. <laughs> he, <laughs> this is great. He's very specific. But you know what? He knew what he was well, talking about. Well, it kind of makes him seem like a real normal, average, regular guy. He, well, he was. He, he wrote what? really— What? No. <laughs> he, he was average in that— he admitted he called himself a savage from the woods of America. He knew that he was a naif, that he was not cultured in the ways of the old world. And when they, when he and his daughter and their slave James Hemings first got to Le Havre, uh, his daughter said they were cheated by the stevedores, and it cost as much to get their baggage from the ship to their hotel at Le Havre as it did to ship their baggage from America to Europe. So that at first, Jefferson couldn't speak French. He didn't know his way around. He got cheated. They wind up in Paris. They want to stay at the Hotel d'Orléans, and they go to the wrong one. There are several by the same name. They go to the wrong hotel. It, you know, it's rough. When you first go to Europe as a child, as a young adult, or as, as, a, as a full-on adult, when you first go, you don't know the ways of Europe. And you make mistakes. You order the wrong things. You 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 overpay for things. You make you you prove your ignorance about some important social customs. So you need somebody like Jefferson to be your mentor. Today you can buy 
you know, the Blue Guide to this and Rick Steves' Guide to that and Europe on $200 a day and so on. But in his time, no such books existed. And so he he loved to serve as this role of sort of the the guide mentor to other people. We had a letter from Angel Kumasaku, um, and I hope I'm pronouncing that close to right, um, which, by the way, means Japanese for bear on a hill or a slope. Uh, what, ku- Kumasaku means bear on a hill? Kumusaku. Wow. Um, and she was d- decent enough to spell it out phonetically for me. Thank you. <laughs> I hope I'm close. Anyway, she writes about a BBC documentary that she watched about um, Machiavelli. Yes, the, the Niccolo Machiavelli, the the Renaissance Italian political theorist. And she says she did a little research in that uh, uh, it said that some of the founding fathers were influenced by his Republican ideas, especially John Adams. Could you speak about this, and is that true? Yes. So Adams wrote this immense... Um, multi-volume work on constitutions, the history of constitutions. Uh, it actually was a, turned out to be a very controversial book but because it made him seem as if he were a monarchist, which he actually wasn't. He was writing based upon a book called Discourses on Davila, which is another one of, um, of Adam's books, which was a commentary on Machiavelli. And so he knew Machiavelli. Now, Machiavelli has – there are two Machiavellis. There's the Machiavelli of the prince, same person, but different different approach. The Machiavelli of of the prince, this famous pamphlet, is a cynical believer in real politic and that you do what you have to do to manipulate people and get get what you want done in the world and and it's it's really about um, uses of power without a lot of integrity to accomplish your political goals. And therefore, Machiavelli is the prince became a notorious book about political cynicism and the wrong path. And, corruption too, right? right? Yes, using corruption. And of course, so so that's a distinguished part of the history of, of politics. But the, the, the other Machiavelli, same person, different lens, uh, was an ardent Republican with a small r. And he was writing about how these um, Italian city-states could be true republics and he was much in earnest, and so Jefferson is more taken by that Machiavelli, Machiavelli the small R Republican, than by Machiavelli of the Prince, because Jefferson is an idealist who famously said, nations should behave like people. You should be honorable in your dealings. You should be loyal. Your word should be your bond. Uh, you should not be cynical. You should not take advantage. That, that, that It's in the interest of nations to behave with the kind of integrity of a noble person. And so that's exactly the opposite of, of the Machiavelli of the Prince. Great letter. Yeah. Um, he, reading about him, he, he was pretty prolific. He was, and and so he's a he's a major figure, and it's too bad, you know. So you have this you have this major Renaissance humanist, who's now known for this one pamphlet, right? Which is not fair. Because he's so much more than that, but that's the nature of things. And people, this happens to people all the time. He uh, he wrote plays. Um, he wrote. Uh, he served as a senior official in the Florentine Republic. Um, wrote comedies, carnival songs, poetry. Um, his personal correspondence is renowned by Italian scholars. And so yes, and so if you say to a thousand people. What did Machiavelli do? They'd say, oh, he wrote this deeply cynical tract called The Prince. For him, that was just, that's like Sir Thomas More, who wrote Utopia as a kind of a throwaway piece. Sir Thomas More wrote voluminously about Christian doctrine and attacking infidels and attacking Lutheranism and, and uh, enormous books of, do- of devotional Christianity. And he's remembered historically for Utopia. Well, they, they, might, they should have understood that there are certain things that human beings are attracted to and that speak to them, um, perhaps not. No, uh, absolutely. You can't decide how history is going to remember you. That's up to history. Well, again, thank you, Angel Kumusaku, for that letter. And bear that in the mountains? Uh, bear on a slope or hill. Yeah, there you go. Uh, and thank you again for writing. And r- with that, we're going to take just a short break. We have a few more letters to answer, and we'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to... 
the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. I'm Clay Jenkinson. Out of character this week and sitting across from me, not in the barn, but in the studio this week is the semi-permanent guest host of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. David Swenson. Sir. With, with, with dirt under my fingernails and proud of it. You were out in the garden this I weekend. Was, of course. I know we have a couple of serious uh, pieces of mail that you're going to get to. But uh, do you remember recently we did a show on smallpox? It was real fun. I learned a lot. It was your suggestion. It was a great show. Important show. We have a measles outbreak in this country, and there is going to be a national conversation about vaccination coming. Right after that show, we got a a piece of mail from Chip Crawford, and I kind of missed it. I wanted to bring it up to you. He said, I wanted to share a chuckle that he had when the iTunes notification came through announcing your new episode. And the, he, he wished he had a screenshot of it because the wording was, the Thomas Jefferson Hour, smallpox is available. <laughs> you know, it pops up your notification. It's signed yours patriotically, Chip. And thanks, Chip, thank you, Chip, Chip. Crawford. I hope you have, thanks. I hope you have taken your vaccine. And he's from North Texas. I have one from Paul Grossgold. He's written to us before. It's a serious thing. It is. I would like to come at the Second Amendment debate from a different angle. Are rights mutable over time? If we truly believe that rights as those enumerated in our Bill of Rights are not given by governments but rather guaranteed by them, is it then legitimate for government to rescind them? With respect to the right to bear arms, the answer for many people is yes. Before taking such action, we should consider the potential consequences. For once that line is crossed, which of our other rights might be next? Might the government, under the guise of increasing security in a dangerous world, seek to set aside our right not to be subject to unreasonable searches and seizures? Could the right to a free press be abridged for political security reasons? These are not academic questions. Both the Adams and Wilson administrations sought to quell First Amendment freedom of speech through sedition acts. So what he's saying is, you know, sometimes I say on this program that changes in technology probably mean changes in the way we think about some of these uh, rights, including the Bill of Rights. And so a musket from Jefferson's time is not the same as a semi-automatic handgun. So would that change the Founding Fathers' view of the right to keep and bear arms? He's saying, wait a minute, before you go down that path, ask yourself tough questions about whether this is a slippery slope. And when you're starting to talk about changing circumstances, if you don't wind up taking away other sacred rights, as guaranteed under our Constitution, and you may live to regret cracking open the the Bill of Rights because if you do it for what you take to be a good and thoughtful purpose, it may have consequences that really come back to bite you. So it's really, I think, a good and, and important uh, point to raise, David. I do too. It you know, it, it, I, it's pardon me, but what goes around comes around. I, I, it really does, and. Um, the reason some of these uh, laws and rights are awkward for half of the constituency or nearly half of the constituency is it's a, there's a good reason for that. It, it, democracy isn't isn't something that everybody is always going to like. There's a great line about um, who is it? Adam something about uh, democracy is like two wolves arguing with the uh, sheep about what they're gonna have for dinner or something. <laughs> no, I've like never that. heard it before. Something like that. What? Yeah. Who says this? Madison? Uh, Adam? I'll, I'll find it. Not 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 Madison. I'm sure. I just remember coming across that. But what goes around comes around, and a great example is this uh, executive order um, because it's a national emergency. We're gonna build a wall. And a lot of Republican or Trump supporters say, great, okay, well, what if we get a real uh, crazy left-wing progressive president that says, you know, you you can't use straws anymore because it's a national emergency or uh, – you follow me. I've said enough. (laughs) I'm in trouble already. The point that's made is what if a leftist came in and said we have a national health care emergency, I'm going to create universal – Healthcare, Medicare for all by executive order. The question is, if you go down that path of declaring a national emergency for policy reasons, does that open the door to that becoming a, a sort of a routine trick 
of the party that happens to be in power. And I think that's a very legitimate concern. I don't think that, frankly, that Trump or the Trump administration has thought this through very well. And you heard some of the most um, conservative members of the Congress of the United States saying, warning, warning, this is not probably the yeah, smartest but way you know to what? get to it, that wall. It's too late. It's already happened, and it's going to happen again. And just just to get this by my sensors, I think straws and plastic trash are a huge problem, Okay. We're not going to go into the plastic bag controversy of North Dakota in, in 2019, but go ahead. No, that's it. That's all I got. That's all I got. All right, so that was a good letter. I like that. Here's one from Sean Dolenz. I just read with interest that Jefferson met John Paul Jones in France. I also learned that Jefferson's negotiations with the envoy of Tunisia regarding the Barbary pirates went much more smoothly because Jefferson hinted that he could offer a lady of the night. Well, yes and no. So in the world of diplomacy then, and I'm sorry to say even now, there are often uh, requirements, requests, conditions of emoluments, let's call them, that would shock uh, a Methodist minister. And Jefferson and Adams were aware of the propensities of these Tunisian and other North African diplomats. And they, in trying to advance America's interests with them, didn't provide escorts, but made it clear that such things were probably doable. It you know, you don't want to know much about the making of the sausage. Let's just put it that way. It's a it's a sad business. But no, Jefferson didn't pimp out some British woman. Well, I'm glad you know, to hear to that. To the Tunisian diplomats, but 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 it's true that you know these things do happen, and you don't want to know much about it because we're talking about a level of incredible power, privilege, and and blackmail. Like someone said. I'm not going to sign on to your extremely important treaty unless, you know, when I give talks around the country, David, people always say, oh, we're so glad you're here and so on. I say, yeah, but I'm so offended. When I got to my hotel room, I don't know if you read the contract, but when I got to my hotel room, there was not a bushel of pale blue M&Ms waiting for me. <laughs> and then once in a while, they go, oh, my, no, we'll go out and buy them. But I just say it because that's what happens. One woman that I worked for in Boston a uh, big insurance company long ago, so I made this joke or a joke like it, and she said, that's not so funny. She said, we had a rock group that came to our national well, convention. That's famous stories about and that. And they demanded like 65 cases of Heineken chilled and waiting in the room. Oh, geez. Anyway, uh, it's been a fun conversation. I always enjoy um, going through all the mail. And, and if you'd like to submit a question to the show or a comment or a criticism or ask President Jefferson, go to Jefferson Hour. Dot com and you can find out more about the show, Clay's Cultural Tours, supporting the show, all there. But right now, sir, it is time for this week's Jefferson Watch. We have been living for a very long time with the idea of executive supremacy. Some misguided attorneys have argued since the presidency of George W. Bush for what they call the unitary executive by this they mean that the power of the president is virtually unlimited, not only throughout the executive branch of government, but in the other two branches also, and that there is no effective or legitimate check on the president's powers at home or in the international arena. These are the same people, by the way, who argue for what they call constitutional originalism. We got to the twilight zone of executive supremacy somewhat accidentally, by way of two world wars in the mid-20th century, the invention of the atomic and then the hydrogen bomb, the instantaneousness of war in the age of Sputnik, the pace of modern mobility and modern communications, crews and ICBM missiles, asymmetrical terrorism, and now cyber war. There is a long debate in historical circles about whether America sought world hegemony or just bumbled into it, but it is clear that in the 21st century we need a larger and stronger national government than Thomas Jefferson could possibly have understood, and a much stronger executive than the Founding Fathers envisioned. All except Alexander Hamilton, of course. But here's the truth, at least according to the U.S. Constitution that was hammered out in the summer of 1787 and ratified by the people of the 13 original states in the months and years that followed. Not only is Congress a co-equal branch of government, 
but it was created by the Constitution in Article I. The executive is only Article II, and the judiciary Article III. The Founding Fathers clearly intended to make the legislative the primary branch of the national government. It's obvious. Had they intended the executive branch to be supreme, they would have made it Article I. This makes perfect sense in Republican theory. Here's how Thomas Jefferson saw it. The people themselves are sovereign. They have a natural right to govern themselves in pure democracy in which every single citizen participates in the deliberation of every public issue. According to our social contract, however, the people choose not to govern themselves directly. Instead, they elect individuals to represent them in public councils. These representatives of the people serve on the school board, the city and county commission, the state legislature, and in the Congress of the United States. The Founding Fathers were so committed to the idea of representation that they created two houses in Congress. The Senate consists of two at-large representatives from each state, called United States Senators, and the House of Representatives works by way of congressional districts of roughly equal population size, currently 435 of them nationwide. This is the essence of the United States government, representative democracy enshrined in the two houses of Congress. The Congress is the only branch of the national government that can pass laws. The judiciary reviews laws but does not create them, and the executive branch executes our laws but does not write them. That's why Congress balked recently when the current president tried to build a wall on the Mexican border when Congress itself had explicitly chosen not to appropriate funds to do so. In our system, only Congress can spend the people's money. If legislative supremacy was the decided will of the Founding Fathers in Philadelphia, Jefferson was committed to that concept even more than his compatriots. He once advised President Washington that he should not veto congressional legislation if he disagreed with the policy, but only if he thought the legislation violated the U.S. Constitution. In Jefferson's formulation, the president's duty was to fulfill legislative mandates. He would also make recommendations to Congress, of course, and conduct foreign policy, but Congress could refuse to accept the president's recommendations whenever it pleased. For most of the 19th century, Congress was supreme. It wasn't until the presidency of Abraham Lincoln that the executive really took control, and that was because of an unprecedented national crisis of existential proportions. But Lincoln was followed by caretaker presidents, Benjamin Harrison, Grover Cleveland, Andrew Johnson, Chester Arthur, Rutherford B. Hayes, etc. Then came the 26th president, Theodore Roosevelt, who more or less invented the modern presidency. You could say that Roosevelt did this before it was really necessary, but he loved power and wanted to accomplish so much for America that he really couldn't help himself. Congress grumbled, but largely gave him what he wanted. Then came the strong presidents of the 20th century, FDR, LBJ, Nixon, G.W. Bush, and now Donald Trump. Here's the constitutional crisis, what might even be called the constitutional nightmare of our time. The current president is now insisting that members of the executive branch will not be permitted to testify before Congress. Subpoenas are being ignored with derision and contempt. Cabinet ministers are refusing to testify before Congress, and when they do appear, they respond to questions with monarchical hauteur. Clear and unambiguous laws are being violated by officials of the executive branch. This is not the first time the executive has thumbed its nose at the legislature in American history, but it is the most brazen, contemptuous, and indifferent episode of executive defiance. But we all know that the only remedy under our Constitution is impeachment, and that we reserve impeachment for something so awful that a successful removal by impeachment has never once occurred in our history, and that it is virtually impossible to believe that 67 members of the Senate would vote to convict any president under our two-party system, which means effectively that not only the president but the entire executive branch of government now lives above the reach of the law. The only hope for our republic is that the legislature would reassert itself as a co-equal under our Constitution. I do not wish to exaggerate. I believe the very survival of the United States under a Republican form of government is now in some jeopardy. And here's the second crisis, a second constitutional nightmare. 
We know that the very people who are defending the current president are by principle and nature committed to originalism and legislative supremacy. In other words, it is not fundamentally about politics with them. It is about constitutional principle. You only have to imagine an executive of the other party arrogating to himself so many powers that belong to Congress, showing such contempt for constitutional norms, behaving like a monarch and at times sounding like an authoritarian despot, to understand how loudly these same principled individuals would be howling at the current distortions of the Constitution if, for whatever reason it is, they were not defending this president, as howl they did when President Obama famously said he had a pen and a cell phone and was prepared to govern the country without Congress if they refused to act. On that occasion, they rightly argued that the Constitution does not permit the president to act unilaterally no matter how frustrated he might be with Congress. So what makes these principled conservatives turn a blind eye to the extra-constitutional behavior of the current occupant of the White House? They may indeed get their conservative judges and Supreme Court justices. They may even get themselves a court that will overturn Roe v. Wade or banish Muslims or restrict the number of brown or third-world immigrants who reach America or close the southern border. When you ask good and decent and law-abiding and civil Trump supporters how they can support a person who is trampling on most of the norms of American life, they say they too deplore the president's tweets and his antics, but hey, we got Neil Gorsuch, didn't we? But will it be worth it? I refer them to Mark 836. Our system works best when it is in balance, when each branch of the government is supreme within its own constitutional portfolio, even when there is a healthy amount of creative tension between the branches. But whenever one branch lords it over the other two, and Jefferson would add, whenever the national government lords it over state and local governments, serious national crises invariably follow. We are in one now, and there is no end in sight. It cannot be ruled out that the current president might do dramatically more rash things in the months or years, possibly six, that remain in his presidency. One of his formerly most trusted conciliaries has testified under oath that he cannot imagine the current executive leaving the presidency peacefully at the terminus of his time in office. That seems unthinkable. Probably, it won't happen. But five years ago, if you had asked me if someone who slept with and then paid off porn stars to keep them quiet could be president of the United States, I would have said, never. I'm Clay Jenkinson. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public Radio. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author, Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any past show for a $12 donation, please call 888-828-2853. Again, that number is 888-828-2853. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.org and on iTunes. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.org. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Music by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program through the eyes of Thomas Jefferson.